Oh, you turned into the, you tuned into the big one today. This is it. This is, uh, I'm Kevin Metcalf. This is the Uncolored Podcast, and you have tuned in to the big one today. It's going to be a packed show. A <laughs> packed show. I've heard that. I'm not sure what that means. But the, look, I got two things to do here. First of all, I'm going to develop the big idea in a different way than I had planned because I, I just came upon something this week. You know, you have a lightning rod and something all of a sudden, something hits you in a way and, and, and things become clear. That just happened this week as I was studying uh, this week's podcast. So, so I'm going to do it in a, in a different way than I did. So I'm going to reverse what I had planned to do, how I had planned to lay this out. I'm going to reverse that and do it from a different way. And I'll get that to a sec. I'll get to that. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But but I also. I've also got a major announcement, but I've also got a major announcement. I figured out how to end. Hunger in America, maybe even the world. I don't know, but we'll we'll start it in America. It may be even the world, but we'll we'll start it in America. I think I've got to put, not only does it stop hunger, but if you got a restaurant, if you own a restaurant, if you're thinking of you're thinking of, 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 of starting a restaurant, if you if you if you live by a re- if if restaurants, this is gonna this is a million dollar idea, I think. Of course, it seems that that's something you'd you'd lead with, if you could, if you could actually solve the hunger problem, you might want to start with that part of it, and then. Sounds gimmicky that I would wait till later to tell you. But no, I'm, I'm going to do it the different. I'm going to flip that over. But you'll love it. It's a, it's, a, it's a million dollar idea. I mean, it's possible I don't know what I'm talking about. That's the more likely possibility. But when, when I tell you what it is, think about it. And you tell me if it wasn't a million dollar idea. I think it's perfect. Now, I don't know why anybody hasn't come up with it yet. I was eating at the IHOPs uh, last weekend. And uh, it, it, the idea came to me, and I thought it was a brilliant idea. So I'll, I'll give that to you uh, in the second segment, in the sports segment. Uh, but first, I want to start off with uh, developing the big idea. Um, so what I had planned to do was I started off the first podcast by sort of fleshing it out as best as I could. And I don't think I did a very good job because it's I really don't have my head around it myself. So, But I gave it the best shot. And then I went into a couple of uh, ideologies, which I believe oftentimes masquerade as ideologies, but turn out to be religions um, in uh, global warming. And then I went to uh, the evolution debate. And so I was going to go into the third one today. But as I was going through it, I think that this topic today uh, really sort of uh, is kind of the daddy of the whole thing, sort of the umbrella that all of these things come out of. And I and I was able to identify what I believe is sort of the through line, the thing that that is the foundational principle of all of these things, or at least what what the real motivation behind all these things are. So before I get to that, um, well, I don't have anything else to do. I'll, I'll just get right to it. So the, the topic is it's Marxism. Now, Marxism is, is an idea that, uh, well, Marx came up. <laughs> Karl Marx came up with it. Or at least he codified an idea. I don't think he came up with the idea, but I believe he he expressed it and codified it in such a way that it made it uh, digestible, consumable by a, a large group of people. That that a lot of people go, oh, okay, I, I also think this too. And there's been a lot of adaptations, different strains of it. Um, and I know that, uh, well, at least in my opinion, you know, communism, socialism, postmodernism, all those things are basically bastard children of, of Marxism. Um, and so I, I, I'm not going to go into the details or deconstruct them all because I'm not nearly smart enough. Uh, but what I will do is I want to focus on what I think is the underlying philosophical, ideological and religious underpinnings of the idea. So that, that's what I'm going to focus on. So first of all, before I get to that, I'm going to tell you something about the big idea that I think will, will make all of these things sort of fit into place a little bit better than, than I have. Uh, I think it will make these things fit into place better than I have uh, been able to do in the past. Uh, but, before, but, but to do that, but to do that, I need to 
read you a story. Now, this is a biblical story. And the reason that I, I, I go from the Bible, because that's really the only you know, religious tradition that I'm familiar with. Um, I haven't read the whole Bible, but, you know, I, I was, you know, I was, uh, uh, in the church, you know, as a kid, you know, when your parents are from the South, they, they make you go to church. And I did that when I was a kid. And then for about seven or eight years as an adult from like 18 to my, my mid twenties, uh, I, I went again to a, a Christian church on myself before I, I stopped going. So I'm familiar with the Bible and that's why I, I draw from, from that book. I, and I don't. I don't claim to, to understand it. Trust me. I, I'm, I'm just just working through it. <laughs> I, look, and I don't claim to understand it. I am by no means a theologian. Uh, you know, I haven't been to church in 25 years, and I, and I, and I won't be going anytime soon. Uh, but I do think that the Bible uh, has a lot of, uh, how should I say, important things to say. There's some stories that I think really map on well. Uh, to reality and teach a lot of good lessons. And, and my feeling is, listen, truth is wherever you find it. It doesn't have to be the Bible. There are a lot of books uh, that I think really nail some really true principles. So the first story that I wanted, wanted to to tell you about, the first story I wanted, so the first story I wanted to talk about is the fall of Satan. And I'm not going to go from the Bible because I, you know, I don't even, I don't have a Bible. Uh, although I guess you could look at it online. I'm sure, I'm sure I can get it online, but I just want to give you a brief rundown of the story. I'm not going <laughs> to read scripture here. Well, I mean, not that that's bad. I just, again, I'm, I'm not the one to, to read your scripture. You should go to somebody else for that. But I think the story is important. And it talks about the, the fall of Satan. So I'm going to read you this from this website called gotquestions.org. And it gives a summary of... Uh, you know, the Bible verses that talk about Satan. I don't know who, who put this together or who the author is, so I can't, you know, I can't vouch for the validity of it. But but as I read it, it, it uh, coincided with my understanding, my, you know, cursory understanding of the whole thing. Um, so I'll read you the last paragraph. It says, why did Satan fall from heaven? It said, Satan falled, falled. <laughs> Fall. <laughs> I'll start again. Why did Satan fall from heaven? Satan fell because of pride. He desired to be God. He, he desired to be God, not a servant of God. Now I'm going to break there because that to me, I think is the key. Well, not the key, but one of the keys of this whole big idea. When I, when I said that uh, most of what masquerades as political or scientific or social discussions I really think it's about this right here. And and I'll develop this later on. I know it's kind of a weird claim because it, it didn't I didn't understand this. Not that I understand it now. This didn't pop into my head um, until recently, although everything that I had read for the past several years sort of bounced around or was swirling around this thing. And when this idea popped into my head, suddenly a whole lot of things started clicking into place. So Maybe this will happen for you too, the the one person who may listen to this. Um, but the idea is that Satan desired to be God, not a servant of God. Um, so it goes on to say, uh, Satan wanted to be God, and interesting enough, that's essentially what Satan tempted Adam, Adam and Eve with in the Garden of Eden. So it, so it wasn't only that Satan wanted to be God, but he seemed to be to have this idea that uh, that I can do this. You know, I can do this thing. We, we don't need God. I, I, I can do what he's doing. In other words, he, he, he somehow felt like whatever God is, that he could do it better. And he did his best. And, you know, if you believe in the Bible and scripture, uh, all he's been doing his whole life, his whole life. I don't, I don't know what you describe it, but but all but all Satan's been doing his whole existence is trying to get folks to come to the same conclusion that you know what we don't need God, we can do this ourselves, and I think that's the essential part of all of these things that we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to leave that 
uh, and go to the second part. And this is the other part, um, the Bible. I, I think this is the other part of the Bible that talks about the same kind of idea. I'm sure that they're all throughout the Bible, or at least you could find other places. I don't know where they are. But it's these two particular ones that I think most people are either somewhat familiar with uh, that I think fall right into place in this this big idea. <laughs> I, I, I am, look, and I'm only calling it the big idea because I don't know what else to call it. I'm not saying it's actually a big idea. Other people have maybe figured this out already. For me, it's a big idea. But what the hell, that's what we're going with. Okay, the second story that I wanted to go over is the story of the Tower of Babel. It's another Bible story. I think it's in Genesis. Here it says from Genesis 11, 1 through 9. And again, I'm reading from the same website, the uh, gotquestions.org. I guess maybe it's a biblical site. I'm not sure. Uh, but it says here, the Tower of Babel is described in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. After the flood, God commanded humanity to, quote, increase in number and fill the earth, unquote. Uh, but it says here, this is the website, not the, not quoting the verse. Humanity decided to do the exact opposite. Then in quotes, it says, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So apparently the idea of this, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not reading this as a history of the world. I'm, I'm just simply relating a story somebody wrote. Um, and I, and I think the story is important because I believe it, 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 uh, it maps on perfectly to what's going on, or at least what has gone on throughout what I believe human history. And I know that's a, that's a huge claim to make, but, but I think I might, let me see if I can back it up. So the idea here is after the flood, um, you know, God says, Hey, go, you know, spread out like, uh, like Mo used to tell Larry and Curly spread out. Uh, but instead everybody goes, no, we're going to hang out here and we're going to build a tower to heaven. Now, I have heard, and I don't know that this is true. This is just something that I'd heard. But it's a bit of an allegory to build this tower uh, in an attempt to elevate themselves. And it says here, and it even says here in the passage that we want to make a name for ourselves. We want to be the big dogs. And, and I'm, that's me expanding on that. That may not be the actual case. But that's what I got out of it. That instead of going out and, you know, kind of doing their own thing, they wanted to huddle together in unity and create this one big, you know, city organization, whatever it is. Now, reading again on the website, it says, uh, in response, God confused the languages of humanity so that they could no longer communicate with each other. That's in Genesis 11 through 7. The result was that people congregated with other people who spoke the same language and then went together and settled in other parts of the world. And again, I'm not reading the history of the world. I'm just simply relating a story from the Bible that I think is, is an important story. So the idea that, that I pulled out from this that I think relates to this topic is there's something about that comes from, if you know, understand the idea of God, that thinks it's a good idea for people to kind of go out and figure things out for themselves in, in different places, in different ways and in different, you know, means and methods and mechanisms, you know, go out and figure out your own thing. And for some reason, human beings, we like to congregate together and everybody think the same, be the same, act the same and do the same. There is this, this something that compels us. To, to not like different stuff, right? They want one city, you know, one tower, everybody doing the same thing. And God's idea was, if I'm reading this right, which there's every possibility that I'm not, but, but if I understand this properly, what God is saying, go out and, and do your own thing. And they didn't want to. They wanted to hang out together and have sort of a monolithic society, and I believe that that idea is prevalent all throughout history. There's a groups of people who say, listen, let me do my own thing. We're going to go, you know, we're going to go hang out and do our own thing. 
And then there's this other part of society that somehow wants to compel people to live together in one monolithic idea. And I, and I will go to uh, as, as evidence for that. And I got to dig it up. I'll, I'll dig it up at some point in time. But I remember Sam Harris. And Sam Harris is an atheist. And, you know, he was given a talk about something. I don't remember it was. But at one point in the talk, you know, he's talking about his utopia, which is what atheism is really about is, you know, having your own utopia on the planet. Um, he started talking about wouldn't it be great if everybody believed the same thing and we just had one, you know, unified ideology. And I remember kind of chilling to me that everybody in the audience, you know, or I don't know if everybody, but there's this huge cheer from the audience with the idea of this one unified religious or, you know, reason he wouldn't say religious, although it is this one unified ideology. And, and to me, that's chilling because people are so different and, you know, they, they talk about diversity and, and I think they are people who talk about diversity are full of shit. Most of the time, <laughs> I'm sorry, Papa. I'm sorry, Bob. I said a bad word. Um, it, it, it Baba gets upset. My dog, when I, when I use harsh language, he doesn't like that. Um, but while, you know, atheists don't believe that they're promoting religion. Um, I believe in fact they are promoting religion, but people are so diverse and have different ideas, different needs, and they're so complex that the idea of having one unified, you know, way of thinking means that there's a lot of people who are going to have to be put down because nobody agrees on everything, you know. It, you know, people have all kinds of different ideas about everything. Even people within the same umbrella of thought disagree on a whole lot of stuff. So the idea of having one unified way of thinking to me um, is worrisome at best. I, I think that the best place for everybody is for folks who understand each other properly to hang out together while letting other people who understand each other to hang out each other and, and stop and don't stop messing with each other. You know, people can move in between groups where they feel comfortable, but this idea that there's one group and one way of thinking. And, and if you don't go along with us, then we got to do something about that. That's always a dangerous ideology. And that's the second part of it that in my opinion gets to the heart of this whole, you know, all of these ideologies that are masquerade or all of these religions that are masquerading as different ideologies is that there's good ones and bad ones. And if we put it all in the context of religion, it really comes down to this. There's good religions and there's bad religions. And here's how you identify them. In my opinion, if you think of religions as a mechanism for organizing a community or group of people, which is really what I think that's what a religion is. It's simply a way of organizing a group of people. And I know that folks will know it's how you get to heaven and, and those kinds of things. And listen, I'm not going to argue anybody because I don't, I don't argue religion with people. People believe what they believe and God bless them. But it seems effectively what a religion is, is simply a way of organizing people. And let me, let me explain how I came to that idea. So I was watching, uh, what's this movie? Uh, Lock, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Amazing movie. I think it's the, is that the one? One of them's with, uh, yeah, it's the one where they, they're looking for the diamond. Jason Statham and, and, uh, and a bunch of other great actors in there. And there's one part where Ari, who's the, the Jewish, I don't even know if he's Jewish or not, but he's a diamond dealer. Um, and uh, Benicio Del Toro was also in the movie. And he goes in to, to heist the place. And they're dressed as Jews. And there's a couple of places where they have these, but they're wearing these black hats and they've got the curly Q sideburns. Um, and that's part of their religious thing. And it occurred to me, that, you know, the different religions have their thing. You know, Amish, they, they've, somehow, they've somehow decided that, you know, 1920 and 1880, that's about the right, you know, amount of technology and and clothes to wear, uh, you know, Catholics got the big hats and the big robes and the big churches. 
uh, the, the big monolithic administrative structure. And it occurs to me that, listen, if you believe that, that God created the universe and, you know, put all the, the heavens in order and the planets where they're supposed to be. And it's like, okay, you got the, the animals there and the trees over there and the people there. Okay. Good. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing. Got to get the hats right. Right. <laughs> I got to make sure that they're wearing the hats and they've got the curly cue. I, the, the sideburns got to be curled just right, right over there. And then the Amish over there got to make sure that they know what, you know, no iPhones, make sure they don't wear iPhone. They, they don't have any iPhones, you know, and I, and I got to have Catholic, I got to have the hats just big enough that you don't have to, to stoop to go through a doorway. All of those things. I need. In other words, I don't think God has anything to do with any of that. I mean, if you, if you've just created the whole universe, I can't imagine that you now care what kind of hats people are wearing. Yet, it seems that certain clothing, certain attire, certain days you worship, certain practices, all of these things are like, you know, it's it's like the main thing, depending on what religion you're talking about. I mean, depending on which religion you're talking about, what you wear, where you go, how you do the it's scripted and orchestrated. And I question whether or not, you know, a creator of the whole universe would really give a rat's ass what kind of hat you're wearing. I, I can't imagine that that's the case. So my only conclusion was, that's not anything from an all-powerful creator. That's got to be humans trying to organize themselves in ways that they feel comfortable, that they think is going to be beneficial to them. You know, the, the Amish think that technology is going to be bad for them. Okay, that's fine. You know, if you're Jewish, you know, wearing a certain hat and, you know, going through particular ceremonies and not doing things some days and doing things other days is, is somehow, you know, works for you guys. And I have no problem with that. Yeah, but, but the idea that somehow God told people to do that, eh, I'm a little skeptical, we'll say. So in my opinion, I think much of what religion accomplishes is simply organizing communities in ways that these communities feel you know, was going to be beneficial to them over time in the long run, I guess. So if that's true about religious organizations and why, what makes politics any different? And in my opinion, no different at all. I mean, politics is just another way for societies to organize themselves. And they pass rules and laws and things you can't wear and things you can't do and things you can and cannot, just like religious organizations. It seems that that similarity um, is a big similarity between both of them. Now, if that's the case, that politics and religious organizations are the same thing. And I think they have the same thing because, again, I said it in the last podcast. That's why there used to be a saying, and I don't know if they say it anymore, but they say you don't talk about politics and religion, you know, in mixed company or in polite company or in some kind of company. And I think that's because... They're the same thing. Religion and politics, same thing. So, so let me just summarize what I've gotten so far. <laughs> Make sure I know what I'm talking about. Well, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so if, if, in fact, religions are functionally mechanisms by which people can organize themselves... Then religious and politics, same thing. Then religion and politics, same thing. The difference being, or at least one of the differences being, that one religion has its central figure, a transcendent agency, and the other religion does not have a transcendent figure as its central agency. figure. And the other religion does not have a transcendent agency as its central figure. Generally speaking, that, that's generally speaking. So then the question is, what, what is then, 
if if we know that one religion has God or the idea of God or a transcendent agency as a central figure and people organize themselves around that, then people who don't believe in God, what do they organize themselves around? What What is the central figure of a secular religion? Well, that's you. It's human beings. In fact, for people who don't believe God exists, then by default, they're God. In other words, for people who believe in a transcendent God, the important thing is, what does God want? You know, what, what rules does God make? Uh, it, it, the, the whole idea is to try and discern what are the transcendent values and moral you know, rules and kinds of things. But if you don't believe in God, then it becomes whatever you want. The most important thing is not what... The most important thing in a secular religion is not what God wants, but the most important thing in a secular religion is what do you want? What do you think is important as a human being? And there's no higher authority than you in a secular religion. There's nothing above you to make decisions, laws, rules, any guy to go behind or, you know, any, you know, rules or reasons. Uh, and that's why there's, there's, there's this one debate as to how do morals even come about? Now, people who don't believe in God believe, well, you can be a moral person without any transcendent being. And people who believe in God believe, oh, no, 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 no. Morals have to come from some, somebody from a transcendent authority. There's a, a great debate by or not Roger Craig. He was a running back. Daniel Craig? I think Daniel Craig. He's a theologian, and he goes up against Sam Harris uh, talking about um, can you have morality without an objective, you know, moral authority, without God, basically. And it's a great debate. I, well, I'll get into that later, but I, I thought, you know, everybody goes, who won the debate? And I don't think you ever win a debate. I was very disappointed in Sam Harris's inability to answer any of the arguments put forward by Roger, Roger Craig. <laughs> He's running back by the Craig guy. I'll, I'll get his real name. And, and I'll link to the debate because you should see it for yourself. You know, this Craig guy, and he's a theologian, and again, I'm not a religious guy, and I was interested to hear this thing because I've, I've heard the, the debate. Can you have morals without God uh, or a transcendent being, or can you just make them up as human beings? And I, that's a very interesting question. And uh, the Craig guy put some, I thought, some solid argu arguments. For, uh, the, and the Craig guy put some solid arguments for at least what I thought were incredible arguments. And Sam's response was to kind of run away or invective or, you know, you're stupid if you believe in God and, and all these, you know, normal things that you hear. Um, it, it was it was very disappointing. I, I thought, you know, Sam is, you know, would, would you know, he's hailed as really reasonable, smart guy. Um, I was disappointed. It, it seemed like he just he was on his bicycle a lot to use boxing terms. But that seems to be a, a major bone of contention whether or not you can have an objective morality without some sort of a, a transcendent being. And people who don't believe in God think that human beings can, can come up with that. And uh, people who believe in a transcendent being things, thinks that morals have to come from that transcendent being. Uh, but I get, I'm starting to stray. That's a whole different topic. Uh, let, let me just, getting towards the end of the segment, let me just summarize, or at least I, I'm going to, um, let me just, uh, give you the two things that I think are fundamental precepts of Marxism and the ideas that come out of Marxism, socialism, etc. And also the two fundamental flaws with those precepts. And the first one has to do with determining value. Uh, the Marxist ideology seems to believe that Ter determining value can be done in a top-down manner, meaning somebody or some group at the top can tell everybody how much things are worth, how much your your value as a as a worker, how much you should be paid as a worker, uh, how much shoes should, should cost. Every everything Marxist believes they can just somehow 
pick out the value of things. Uh, whereas in a free market system, the idea is that it's determined in a different way. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that way, because I think it's, it's one of these, it, it, it speaks to the fact that I believe that Marxism comes from a place of arrogance and love of its own intelligence. Uh, it's an arrogant idea, in my opinion, to think that you understand reality so well uh, that you can figure out everything for everybody else. Uh, and that seems to be a, a common characteristic that comes up in socialism, communism, those things, that there's somehow a group of super smart people who are supposed to figure out everything for everybody else. And to me, that's just simply, that's just ego, a, a delusional ego. Um, and I'll talk about how prices really work, how value really works uh, in the sports segment of the podcast. But the second thing is where I think that the ideas of Marxism are fatally flawed is in the area of fairness. Um, Marxists and socialists and communists, they continually ra uh, rail against unfairness. They call it uh, inequality today. But somehow they look at the world and they'll look at one person or one group of people and they have some metric, some algorithm. I don't know how they determine it, but they'll say this person has too much uh, and the only way they could have gotten it is by stealing from the poor people. So if you're poor or underprivileged, uh, it's not anything that you did because according to Marxist ideas, you know, the individual is just, you're like a, uh, you're, you're kind of like that steel ball in the pinball machine. You know, you really don't do anything. You're just subject to bouncing off different things. And if you come up with a low score, it's, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with everything else around you. So in their mind, if you don't have a lot, it's because you're a victim of somebody who has a lot. And that's a presupposition uh, of, of Marxism and socialism, or at least it seems to be. And I think it's less about that they want to help poor people and more about they hate rich people. It seems to be. And I'll illustrate that uh, in a later podcast when I go a little bit deeper into Marxism. I'm just trying to give you some broad outlines here. Uh, so the idea of fairness that they have, uh, I think, is fatally flawed because, uh, in my opinion, it seems that there's no such thing as fairness. It, it seems that life is you get what you get, and the only question is how are you going to deal with it? And, and think of it this way. When people say that something's not fair, I think what they're really saying is, I don't like how this situation turned out. I think that's what they're really saying. Because really, how do you even determine what is fair? Now, I think there's a way, but I don't think it's that somebody comes in and just determines it arbitrarily. So, and I'll give you an example. So, and I'm going back to sports again, because that's all I really understand. At least I think I do. So there's this big kerfuffle about the, the overtime system after the last two uh, championships in the NFL. They don't like the overtime system because, you know, two teams play through regulation, and at the end they're tied. And now the overtime is determined by a coin toss. And whoever gets the coin, the coin, coin whoever gets the coin tossed, uh, if they go down and score a touchdown, they win the game and it's over. Now, if they only score a field goal, then the other team gets to get the field to to take the field. Their offense gets to take the field, and then they can see if they can either score a field goal, which means it starts all over again, or maybe it ends in a tie. I'm not quite sure. Or if that team the second time or the second team gets a touchdown, then they win the game. And people think that that's not fair because if your offense is good and your defense is bad, then you don't get a chance to have your offense. And the people in Kansas City were really upset about that, and they think that's unfair. Okay, that's fine. Here's the question. Who's right? In other words, if you look at the way the overtime is done in the NFL right now, and you say, man, that's fair. I mean, listen, if you don't want to go to overtime and you think your, your defense is bad— and you don't want to leave it up to a coin toss, then you better win in regulation. And if you don't win in regulation, then too bad. And a lot of people think that that's fair. Now, there's a whole other group of people who said, no, that's not fair. Both teams should be guaranteed to have their offense and their defense on the field. 
They think that's fair. And the question is, who's right? And, and, and not even by going over the details, just simply this. If you're on one side, then and you think that that's what's fair and you're saying that's fair and there's no argument about it, everybody's free, then what's wrong with the other people? I mean, they're dummies. Do they not even know what fair is? Right. And if you're on the other side, same thing. How, how do you have two groups of people, both intelligent, both, you know, love football, know everything about football, experts on either side, and they have two different opinions on what actually is fair? And the answer is, there's no such thing. You, you either like the outcome or you like the way it is or you don't like the way it is. Because I'll tell you what, if they changed it to another system, I guarantee you there'll be a whole group of people going, that's not fair either. So the point I'm making is that fair is not some objective standard. And as I say, I don't even think it exists. The, the best thing you can do is to try to find a situation that both sides will live with. And you go, okay, that's fair. I mean, if you're, if you're at a job and you don't think you're getting paid enough, well, how do you know? You, you might think your, your value is more. You might think your value is less. But who determines that? And, and what that really gets into is, again, determining value. The, the, the concepts of fairness and value are tied together. And I think that Marxists and socialists get them both wrong. Because they believe it's some sort of a top-down dictatorial thing where a group of people have, for whatever reason, are smarter and wiser than everybody else who's ever lived, and suddenly they're going to figure it out for everybody. And usually that ends up in Russia or Venezuela where people have these, these storehouses of food. Because listen, it's not that Venezuela doesn't have any food. They've got storehouses of food. It's just they got no place to get. They have no way to get to them. Or maybe that's Russia I'm thinking of. Maybe, maybe Venezuela is different. Uh, but, w but one of the books I read, and I'll have to get that out, is that uh, it wasn't that, that w what they were saying was that over the 100 million people that's estimated that died in the 20th century under socialist or communist regimes, that the vast majority of them died from starvation. Which means that whatever pricing system or whatever central planning they did apparently didn't work very well. So there has to be another way. And people like Adam Smith and Hayek and, and uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, from the, that Austrian school, I just think it was Australian school, but it's Austrian school of uh, economics. They have a totally different way. And I believe that works. But uh, we're going to end right there because I, I could go on forever on that and I don't want to go too far. So in the next segment, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, value and pricing uh, with the NFL. Um, and we're going to get into the solution that saves the planet from hunger. That it, You're going to love this. Th this is what you should have stuck around for. Well, the other stuff was good, too. Well, maybe not that good. But this, you're going to love this, this solution. I think it's a great idea. So uh, that's it. I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, this is Kevin Metcalf, and this is the Uncolored Podcast. And I'll be right back in a bit. Here's another unsolicited, unsponsored shout out to an organization that I think is pretty good. It's the Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, please consider giving some donations to the folks down at the Wounded Warrior Project. You can find them on woundedwarriorproject.org. They do a lot of good things for our, uh, our veterans, getting them integrated back in society, mental wellness, physical wellness, all kinds of good stuff, all kinds of good programs and things like that. So if you have time or resources, please consider the Wounded Warrior Project, helping them out there. Yeah, that's it. All right, that's enough. All right, we're back. This is Kevin Metcalf. This is the Uncolored Podcast. This is the Uncolored sports segment of the podcast, and I'm going to talk about a sports-related topic, and then I'm going to solve world hunger. I've already promoted that enough, so I'll, I'll get right into that later. But first, uh, I, I talked in the last part about value and pricing, 
And I'm just going to give you a little bit of an example of how a free market does it, which is a much better way to do it, in my opinion. So uh, I don't know if you've been following the NFL, but if you have, you know that Le'Veon Bell, who was the, the superstar running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, last year, he held out this year. In the 2018-2019 season, uh, he came to the opinion that he wasn't getting paid enough. He signed, I don't know, I don't know what the hell his contract was, but he was one of the highest players. Apparently, he's not anymore. And he says that uh, whatever contract that he signed with the Steelers, uh, he's considered it, and apparently, he's not making enough money. So from Le'Veon Bell's perspective, the value that he brings to the, to the Pittsburgh Steelers is not commensurate with his compensation, whatever that is. I don't even know what it is. So he believes he wants the Steelers to pay him more because he thinks he's worth more. Okay. Now, on the other side, you've got the Steelers. Now, the Steelers are like, eh, you're not worth that much to us. We, we signed a contract. That's how much we think we're wor you're worth. And if you don't want to play for that contract, we're not going to pay you and you don't play for us. And we'll just, and that'll be it. So the question is, who's right? Is Le'Veon Bell worth more than what the Steelers are paying him? Or do the Steelers have it right and he's worth what he had signed for the contract? Now, a lot of people in, in sports media, they're saying, oh, you got to pay Le'Veon Bell. That's why they missed the, the playoffs. And if only they paid them that much money, they'd be in the playoffs. So there are a lot of people who agree with Le'Veon Bell that he's worth whatever it is he's asking. Now, my opinion is that's up to the Steelers. Now, apparently the Steelers are going, listen, uh, you, you know, you missed a couple of, you know, you, you've been suspended once or twice for some off the field stuff. Uh, you're injured. You know, maybe you're not, uh, you know, you're a year older than you were before. Uh, we got another guy running back, uh, running who might be able to do what you can do. And apparently the guy who replaced him this year put up some pretty good numbers for most of the season. So from the Steelers perspective, they're like, nah, you're not worth it. Now, who's right? Well, they're both right. Because value is not determined by Le'Veon Bell, nor is his value determined by the Steelers. So let's say, and it looks like, that Le'Veon Bell isn't going to be with the Steelers next year. Now, there may be another team, and usually there is, people think it's going to be the Jets this year, who the hell knows, who will say, Le'Veon Bell, we're going to pay you whatever it is you think you're worth. Now, just because the, Se the Steelers said that He's not worth that much. Doesn't mean that another team might think he is. And that's okay. If, if, if Le'Veon Bell and whatever team agree on a price, then that's fine. That's what he's worth. In other words, you only know the value of something until two agencies agree. One, one agency can't tell the other person what it's worth. And the other person who's going to buy it can't tell the other person what it's worth. They both have to agree before you can know what the price is, right? And we all know this. If you're, if you're, you know, in the mall and you see a pair of shoes, you, it may be a hundred dollars. You're like, there's no way I'm paying a hundred dollars for those shoes, right? Meanwhile, the person behind you is going, oh my gosh, that's a deal. You're both right. The person behind you thinks it's a great price for it. You think it's not a good price for it. You're both correct. And here's the thing. I'll tell you what, if you come back a week later, that might not be the price because it could turn out that the only person who thought that was worth $100 was the person behind you and nobody else thought that. And typically what the company will do will go, well, guess what? That really wasn't the value of those shoes, so we're going to lower the price. It's always a cooperative effort between the person selling and the person buying. That's how you know what the value of something is. No, no central central planning agency can tell everybody what something costs. They don't know. And, and that's why the free market system is far better because it has the one thing that a central planning organization never has, the ability to be nimble, the ability to be responsive. Because the complexities, especially of a country like ours, where we've got so many people, so many products, so many desires, so many want. When you start mixing all that together, 
the number of different combinations of wants, needs, desires is endless. And there's no way that one government organization can tell everybody what everything's worth. It's just impossible. And that's why socialists, they, they never work. It, when you have a central planning agency, what you do is you mask important data, important information that the free market gives you readily. The person making those shoes at 100 bucks will know within a week or two whether or not that was the correct price by how many people buy them. And now that shoemaker has information so that they can adjust the price or scrap it all together. Maybe nobody wants it. But without that data, that changes moment to moment. Nobody knows what anything costs anymore. And if a central agency had planned and said, hey, it's worth $100, well, guess what? They're going to have a warehouse full of shoes that nobody buys. And there's another there a book I was reading yesterday where they talked about that, uh, and, and maybe in the Soviet Union where I was reading about this stuff, but they were saying they got a warehouse full of shoes. They had, they had made three pairs of shoes for everybody, yet the warehouse was full because nobody wanted them. Central planning tells you what you will get. Free markets give you what you want. And they know what you want by the prices. That's why the, the stock market goes up and down. Nobody knows what the hell the stock market does. Because there's so many, there's an endless number of factors that go into determining what prices and what things are cost. So listen, any, anybody who tells you they know what the market is, they're lying. Nobody knows. E e even those high-priced you know, those whatever, I don't know what the hell they get on Wall Street for telling everybody, you know, what the stuff, you know, people go to the, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I'm just saying, look, if somebody's in an office, right, and they're getting some commission salary to tell you what the stock market's going to do. I mean, I mean, if I knew what the stock market was going to do on a regular, what the hell I got a job for? I'm sitting at home stacking cheese. I, I got, I'm folding money at home. I'm not getting a job to tell other people. How the stock might, if I know, I'm just going to sit back and make money. Nobody knows what it does. Now, now that doesn't mean that there are some people, there are indicators and patterns and stuff like that that they study that might give you a little bit more information because I sure as don't have any. And I know people who, who do well in the stock market. But they understand that it's not predictable, that it changes all the time. And you have to be nimble. You have to respond to change. You, what looked good yesterday could be terrible tomorrow. You just never know. Which is why a centrally planned, you know, the, some government centrally planned, it'll never work. It never works. And we have all of the 20th century and all of the starving people of all these socialist company, countries as evidence. Which, which is stunning why anybody ever comes up with. Eric Weinstein was on the, the, the uh, he has on Ben Shapiro's Sunday conversation. And Eric Weinstein's a super smart guy. I have no doubt that the guy's a genius. I, he was on the Dave Rubin program talking about something, about numbers or something. And I don't know, these fourth dimensions and junk like that. And then the top of my head popped off. I had no idea what he's talking about within five minutes. So, I'm, so clearly he's a genius guy. Right. But he's talking to Ben Shapiro and they were talking about, you know, people looking for jobs. And he goes, hey, we need hyper socialism. What a stupid thing to say. It's the dumbest idea ever. Only because it never works anywhere. I know people talk about Denmark and Sweden. It worked out. Listen, Denmark or Sweden. I don't know which one. They're both. I don't know which one they are. They're, they're up there. But they'll tell you that we're not socialist. We, we tried it for 20 years. It screwed everything up. We went back to free market systems. Johan Norberg has a whole hour special on that on the on the uh, the free to choose uh, YouTube channel. Look at Johan Nor Norberg special when he talks about is it Denmark or Sweden? I can't tell which one's this, the the difference. They're they're close to each other. I think it's Sweden. But yeah, they tried socialism for twenty years. They were one of the richest countries up until that time, and then they tried it for twenty years, started to go broke, and they go, you know, we're going to go back to free market stuff. Because it never works. Yet intellectuals, people who think they know everything, that's their first go to. And I think it's because not because they care about anybody, but because it gives them control. If you've got control of a big, huge government, you can make people want do what you want them to do. 
And I think ultimately these intellectuals who think socialism is the greatest thing, I think they're sitting back and they're you know running computer simulations and teaching classes and not living in the real world. And oh boy, if everybody did what I said, I'll tell you what, man, the world would run great. And every dictator throughout time has said the same thing and just screwed up everything. Yet intellectuals think that they're the guy who can do it. It's a stupid idea. It's a stupid premise. So I'm going to leave it at that. And we'll get to that uh, in another podcast. But finally, here we are. I don't have any fanfare to play or anything like that. But so so Saturday I'm at IHOP and uh, I'm, I'm sitting there. My, my wife and I were having breakfast and uh, she's having a tough time finishing, you know, what she had ordered. And, and I and I'd done well with what I, you know, I, I, I scooped up what I had ordered. It was great. I had the uh, can't remember what I had. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, IHOP has got some amazing pancakes, man. They've got all, they've got, they've got, they've done something to where they've got a ton of different things to order, but the plate is stacked. And I'll tell you what, man, that's, that's my go-to place now. You know, I'm, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere and that's the only really good restaurant around. Uh, but I'll tell you what, God bless. That's, that's a good one. It's the one in the Modesto. Amazing one. But anyway, so I'm sitting there, couldn't finish my, I mean, I finished my meal. My wife couldn't quite finish everything. Short. So she's trying to get me to eat it and I couldn't stuff myself. And I thought, you know what, what would happen if, now, now, now check this out, see, see if this works. You know, you've been to restaurants and the amount of food that gets just tossed in the trash, right? I mean, incredibly wasteful. People eat half what they, they order stuff they don't want. They can't finish it. Happens all the time. I can imagine volumes of good food gets tossed in the trash can all the way. So, so, so what happens if you did this? You're a restaurant. You're at the IHOP or whatever restaurant you got. You have somebody in the back with a big cooker or a grill or whatever it is. Okay. And all of the food that, that people don't eat, not, you know, not half eaten, but I'm talking you get a sausage here, maybe a pancake over there some, and just have somebody in the back mixing it up and making something good out of it make a hash or you know i don't know reconstitute it in some way you watch you watch the the, the cooking network show and they always you, what's that show chopped where they give you a basket of, of of leftovers and they they make it into something wonderful well why not do that with the leftover food and i know people are talking about you know hygiene and stuff like that they're eating out of the trash anyway i mean if you're homeless is it most of the your your dinner coming out of the trash can, or at least a lot of it? So I don't know that hygiene is an issue, and especially if the food is recooked, doesn't that kill off all the germs? So so while people aren't eating all their food, if you find enough you know good stuff from every plate here, I imagine every other plate has got a couple of good things that probably weren't touched or anything like that, or maybe even listen, do this, charge. Maybe a dollar extra per plate. So, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to charge you a buck extra if you don't mind. And then we're going to make something out back for the homeless folks. And that way, you've got the regular restaurant in front. You're, you're getting food that isn't eaten. And maybe you even charge an extra buck so you can take some stuff off the shelf and mix it up in there to make something good. For folks in the back, people living on the street, having a hot meal. You can have Italian, you can have pancakes, all the restaurants are doing it. You're homeless, you don't know what you want to eat. I'm going to have Chinese today. You go to the Chinese restaurant, they got somebody out back mixing up something great. Hot, leftover food. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I was a homeless dude, I would be down for that. If I didn't have the place to live, check me out. I'm at the back of your restaurant, in line, waiting for something good. I, I don't care that it was on somebody else's plate. Mix it up, do something good with it, put a little garnish on it, and I'm good. And, and, and listen, if you're a restaurant owner, what, what a great advertisement. You, you know how on the, on the coast, the left coast and the, and the right coast, how everybody pretends to really care about the homeless, right? Yet these are the same people who are leaving tons of food on their plate and throwing it in the trash, okay? They... The idea that you can tell somebody, hey, if you eat at this restaurant, you're helping the homeless. They love that on the coast. They 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 get a big well, I don't want to say it, but they they they're really excited about when you make them feel like they're helping somebody. So I'm sure they'd be they they would they would they would love to go to your restaurant, be charged extra. You go to the restaurant, 
you know, you charge them a little extra. They'd love that. They, 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 they put themselves on Facebook, Instagram, telling everybody what great people they are and how they're helping the homeless. You can have a bunch of pictures on the on the Facebooks. You know, you're helping the homeless out in the back. Big old line out with happy, smiling homeless people getting hot meals. That's a win win for everybody. You, you, you'd be the you, if you started, you'd be the greatest restaurant in your neighborhood. You'd make more money. You'd help tons of people. It's a win-win for everybody. Now tell me that's not an amazing idea. You write, Give me an email if you think that's a bad idea. If you think it's a great idea, you can have it. I'm not charging you anything because I want to help the homeless too with my amazing... Just the fact, you can just put it like a picture of me on, on the outside of your restaurant. That's all I want. Just put a picture of me sitting there watching the homeless being fed with great gourmet meals. You can have competition and everything. Just run with the idea. It's an amazing idea. I know. I know what you're thinking. Another great idea that I mean. All right. That's enough. Uh, I'm going to end with that. That's, uh, I think that's enough. My name is Kevin Metcalf. I'm your host, and this is the Uncolored Podcast.